welcome to another episode of Morning in the Workshop. I am Krista West. I have been making ecclesiastical vestments for 25 years. This is actually my 25th year. And today's video, I would like to use today to show you how to make a Pro Skinitarian, an icon stand cover, this right here. Now, before I begin, I would like to remind you all that this video is done in spo by, uh, is sponsored by the Calvin Institute for Christian Worship and the Liturgical Arts Academy. You can Google either of those names if you'd like to find out more. Um, this year, the Liturgical Arts Academy, because of coronavirus, was canceled, and so we decided to do some of the information that I would cover with my students we're doing in this online video. This video is designed for the parish seamstress. Um, I would say that you could tackle this project if you have, you know, a year or two of sewing experience under your belt, if you've made maybe some simple drapes, if you've made some clothes, um, some home deck items, you could probably handle this just fine. Now, the very first thing I want to talk about before we begin is materials. Because your finished product uh, is only going to be as good as your materials. And this is something that we covered a lot in the Liturgical Arts Academy last year. A lot of people, when they're trying to outfit an icon stand and make a beautiful cover for it, they don't know where to go to get materials. And I will be honest on that, I don't have really great news on that. They are expensive, and right now there are kind of only two places in America that you can go and get the kind of materials, the kind of liturgical brocades that you need for this kind of product if you want to make this in a very traditional fashion. The first is, uh, for real metal brocades, you can go to La La in New York. However, most of their real metal brocades are well over $125 a yard. So that gets incredibly expensive when you're talking about a piece that takes two yards of fabric. Um, you can also purchase materials from me on my website. I do not do a big business in supplies, but I do import brocades, high-end liturgical brocades, galloons, crosses, and trims from Greece. And so in conjunction with this video, I will be offering a DIY icon stand supply kits. They're basically a kit with everything you need in it to make an icon stand cover. And those will be available at www.kwvestments.com under product line. And then you just scroll down to see supplies and the details are all there. You can also email me if like you don't see a fabric there um, or if you have a question about that. But supplies are really important. Icon stand covers, like many altar cloths, can give literally decades of use, huge amount of use. We're talking 40, 50, 60 years. It's not uncommon because it's a simple piece of fabric that's not really being worn out. So you really do want to use the best quality materials you can. So this is a standard brocade. This is just a standard polyester brocade from Greece. This is a machine embroidered cross. It's a, uh, it will sh I'll show you that in the sewing. This is high quality metallic galloon. Galloon just means trim in Greek. And that's the trim that we use to finish it. And this is high quality metallic fringe. The other thing that you'll see on this icon stand here is a lefkia. This is a little piece of white linen. It's cut about 24 inches by 24 inches. It's hemmed with about a three inch total hem allowance with mitered corners. Finished off with just nice machine made crochet trim. You can hear more about the details of this and more on this in the video on Lefkia. That's spelled L-E-F-K-I-A. It's a word that I just made up because we don't have a word in English for this. And Lefkia just means little bright thing in Greek. And that's what these are used as. And they just make a really nice kind of beautiful package with the, with the icon and the Lefkia and the icon stamp. So let's get started. I'm going to start over here at the ironing board. I have everything already cut. Um, and in an icon, um, in one of the icon supply kits, everything would be cut for you. The cutting of liturgical brocades is kind of a whole nother thing, and it's a little bit challenging. You need a big table, and you have to cut everything by motif. Like where we center the motifs, the crosses, the flowers, that sort of thing is really important. So, I've already done all of that. Now I'm just going to walk through the sewing process. Now this icon stand cover, you'll notice, has a pin marked usually somewhere between 20 to 24 inches from the end. I, right now, I'm kind of really loving the 20 inch spot right there. That's a pin there. That's gonna tell me where I'm going to sew my cross in a minute. Now, I'm gonna start by setting the upper bank. So I'm gonna have this, and I've already pressed this, 
It's very important to press your liturgical brocades to get out any creases and to kind of help set the fabric. Um, it really helps. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, grab my fringe because I forgot to grab my fringe and my ruler. And I'm going to measure my fringe. I'm going to mark a placement line here and then an upper bank placement line. I need to know how big my fringe is. And my fringe here is an inch and a half from this portion, okay? I'm not measuring here all the way up. I'm measuring from here, the part that will be seen down, and I'm adding an eighth of an inch to that. So this is an inch and a half, so I'm gonna mark up an inch and five eighths. I really like just a basic quilting ruler for that, a blue Prismacolor pencil, and I'm gonna hold this down here and mark that out. I'm gonna kinda, if the fabric seems at all uneven, I'm gonna scooch that a smidge, and I'm gonna mark that across. That will be my placement line for where to sew the bottom edge of my galloon, and my fringe will go there. Eventually, when we get done, it'll be in here. This fringe will be right there. Now, I'm also going to sew, I'm actually gonna mark here for the upper bank that I'm gonna sew. And I'm putting it there. I'm measuring eight inches up from the bottom. I'm also looking at the motif going, hmm, I need to make this really make sure that it sits on the motif line. So even if I'm slightly off there, I will make sure that it's exactly across the motif. So like here, I'm doing it all the way across that red bit of the crosses there. Okay, we'll set this aside because we're done with that now. I'm gonna take this to the machine along with my fringe. And I have my balloon over here, ready to go. Now, I'm gonna actually put the fringe around my neck just because it's a little easier for me right now. I'm going to put my glue in some place where I can easily spool it off because I'm going to be doing a lot of that, okay? Now, setting this... Now, I'm having to work without my light because it, it messes up the video, so just bear with me on that. Now, sometimes when you get to Galoon... This one has a pin in it. Be careful of pins. And there'll be a little folded over end. I oftentimes will clip that off. Okay, now, starting here with this being here, I'm setting the glue in about a half an inch and I'm lining up the bottom edge of the galloon, I'm sorry, I'm lining up the bottom edge of the galloon there, but I'm actually sewing the top edge. That's important, because we need to have a spot to set the fringe under. So I'm gonna sew the top edge first. Be careful when doing this, these fabrics are long and they want to like scooch all over the place. So try and keep as much fabric on your table or your workspace as you can to keep it from going out of true. Okay, I'm just sewing across. I'm going to leave my glue in there for a minute because I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Here I am back tacking just to set that because all this is going to be covered in just a minute by other glue. Okay, the ends are. Now here I'm going to set the fringe. I do not want to run the fringe all the way to the edge because it's a waste of fringe. I'm going to set the fringe in about a half an inch too, thereabouts. And I'm setting the fringe under like that and I'm going to sew this now. Now, I am using a used dull machine needle to help me with this process. Basically what this does is it ends up working like a much finer finger and you can get in here and fuss with things. I'm also using it to keep the galloon true. So that basically I'm putting in these little tiny ease pleats every, I don't know, every so often, where they're needed. Um, I can't really give you a real science on that, every maybe three to four inches. Because if I don't do that, then the galloon is gonna wad up all at one end and be really unsightly. And this this fringe has a little, little, this little white stuff that they put on the end to keep it all in good shape when it's in transport, but you can just start taking that off whenever it's convenient. And I'm going all the way across. Now, when I get out to about here, I'm gonna sink my needle. You always wanna sink your needle when you're working on something like this because it will keep everything in place and nothing will skitter off your table. So get in the habit of sinking your needle. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna cut back the fringe. And again, I'm gonna cut it about, about a quarter, about actually about a half an inch back. I'm going to need that other piece of fringe, but not for a long time. So we're going to pop that off to the side and I'm going to finish sewing this across and back tack. Okay. Now 
I've done that. I'm gonna trim my threads on the other end. I've got these little threads here. Here I'm not too precise with these because they're gonna get covered over in, with glue in a minute. Now, you can see how this is going to be. The upper bank, this will be the bottom, we'll eventually sew the cross. What I'm gonna do now is put the perimeter glue on. So I'm gonna get set up for that. I'm going to start at the upper right-hand corner. It's the best place to hide a false miter. And this first section where you are, you have to hide a false miter. Now, the other thing that I'm always in the habit of doing is I just run over my balloon real quick about the amount that I think I'm gonna use. And for this, we typically use about six yards. I'm just running over this real quick to make sure I don't have any flaws because it's really common in balloon to get flaws. Um, it's just part of the process and I don't know, it's just one of those things. You just can't really bother getting upset about it. It's just something that happens. But check your balloon first. I'm setting that out about an inch out and I'm sewing the inner edge right now. So now again, I'm gonna sew the perimeter of this, okay? Now I'm also very carefully kind of holding the cloth in my lap kind of pleat it up in my lap like this. And I'm aligning the edge of the galloon with the edge of the fabric. And I'm also using that machine needle to make sure that I'm sewing it in with a reasonable amount of ease. You don't want the galloon like so tight that it causes the fabric to bubble. Now icon stands, this is gonna take me a while, so we can we can chat a little while while I do this. Icon stands are an awesome project for the parish seamstress. It's all flat sewing. Um, I would recommend that what you could always do is make a little one first. Make a little demo, try out the techniques. You could even take some, you know, if you have even some like ribbon and scrap fabric around, you could just make a muslin just to get yourself familiar with some of these techniques before you attempt it on liturgical brocade. And then maybe you start with a smaller one first. Um, but it's a really great thing that parish seamstresses can do. And for many years, many decades in America, parish seamstresses were the ones who made a lot of the icon stand covers. They weren't always made by professional seamstresses like me um, because it was a pretty easy thing to do. Now, I'm at this point and I'm going to have my handy assistant zoom in. I'm at the point now where I'm getting ready to cover, I'm getting ready to sew down here, but I don't want to sew over that fringe. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel that fringe like that, and I'm going to kind of pull that off, and I'm going to take the little handful of fringe that's in my way, and I'm going to trim it out like that. And what that means is then I won't have any fringe adding bulk or doing anything weird out there. But you gotta get that fringe kind of trimmed out. Now, a minute ago we marked this last line at the bottom for our fringe. We're now gonna create a miter against it and we're gonna sew the bottom edge of, sorry, that's confusing. We are sewing the bottom edge of the galloon, but to be very clear, I'm sewing the upper edge of the bottom galloon. Oops, and I just lost my miter, whoops. I wasn't paying attention there, okay. I thought I had it. That's why you sink your needle. And actually, I thought I had my needle sunk, and I hadn't, so I got my needle sunk there into that false miter, and then I can turn really easily. So actually, I'm kind of glad that happened, so you can see what, why that's important. Now here, you'll notice that the miter kind of wants to pull a little bit this way. You gotta put that baby back in its spot. So just get right in there with your needle, and make sure it stays square to the edge there. Now what that usually means is it's, you're gonna get a little bit of a little mound here. So put a little pleat there. Pleats are your friend when working with glue. You've got to put these ease pleats in, otherwise the galloon um, will be too tight for the whole thing. And, but the ease pleats are kind of amazing. Once you get going with those ease pleats and you get up to the iron, they like magically disappear. Okay, now here I'm, I'm aware that my whole cloth is starting to fall off my table. So I want to be careful I'm positioning that back. Okay. Now I'm still going to again cross that bottom. Okay. And here, I'm getting ready to make my next false miter. So now I'm gonna put my pin in to hold the, the corner, flip it over. That's all I'm doing. Just to make that clear, I'm taking my machine needle so I get a really crisp corner, I'm putting it right there at the corner, and then I am just taking my galloon and going like that. That's that in slow-mo. Don't worry right now if this is totally straight. We're gonna straighten that later. Don't worry about it right now. All you care about right now is that you have two 90 degree angles and that you get your sewing machine needle 
and they're like that. That's all you really care about. Now, just like we did the other, and here again, you want to make sure you put that miter back where it's go, where it needs to go. Now here, you can see the problem. It's a little clearer on this side to see the problem with sewing over the fringe. It'd create a mess right here. So again, once again, we've got to get in there and we've got to trim out any fringe threads that are going to be, that would be sewn under the glue. You just don't want them there. Okay. Oh, and I missed one. So let's see. Let's get that little one in there. I missed that one. And then the other ones you're going to pull out. Here we go. Okay. Like this. Okay. I kind of feel like sewing is oftentimes like a full body, you know, contact sport here. Because you can see as I'm sewing, I'm actually using, I'm actually using my left elbow here to kind of give myself a little bit of stability as I get into this. I do that. I don't always do that, but sometimes I do, especially if I'm working on a bigger piece. It kind of helps me because this, the one thing about these liturgical briquets is they're slippery. They're not like working with a cotton. They definitely have a mind of their own. They kind of are a little, they're a little shifty. They kind of want to go all over the place. So I'm sometimes using my body to get uh, my left side of my body just as much as my right. Okay. And I'm, again, I'm working with those pleats. Oh, I'm still doing that. You can see too that I'm only sewing like about every four, three to five inches maybe, and then I'm repositioning. Yeah, maybe I'm looking at that three to four inches, and then I'm repositioning, and I'm repositioning, and I'm repositioning, and I'm checking. I am probably making this look really easy. Um, the first time you do this, when my students did this at the Liturgical Arts Academy last summer, some of them, it took them over an hour to do this first section, and that is totally okay. Um, I've made thousands of pieces of vestments and altar cloths. So this is really easy for me. I, I mean, I have now probably 30,000 hours under my belt of liturgical tailoring. And so this is easy for me. Don't get discouraged by that, okay? Get, you know, just get some practice going on this. It's going to take some practice. That's why I would strongly recommend that you maybe try, um, kind of try demoing some of this stuff with maybe some scrap fabric and materials you have around your house before you begin on liturgical brocades. Okay, so now I'm coming all the way around. I'm almost all the way around. Okay, now I'm getting ready to set the next miter. This is the upper left corner. And again, I'm putting the pin there and I'm coming around like this. Okay, great. And again, I'm not worried what's coming on here. I'll deal with that later. What I'm really worried is that I get right there with my sewing machine needle. Right there is really important, okay? That Because that's where I need to be pivoting. And you can see when I get closer, I flywheel it. I set my needle in by hand, okay? Now again, oh, huh, another big tip if you are sewing at home. Make sure the back side of your machine, like down on the floor, is all swept and clean and everything. That's really important because this stuff is just so long. It's real easy to, you know, pick up dust bunnies on the back side of your machine. So, like, I regularly have to dust the back of my machine so that it's all clean. Okay, so I'm just sewing across. Now, I'm almost all the way done with the galloon, the perimeter galloon. We call this usually the perimeter galloon because it's going all around the perimeter. It's actually one of the interesting features, um, the really distinctive features of orthodox vestments and altar cloths is galloon. Galloon is just a really unique thing, and it, it creates this very interesting frame um, around all of our vestments, all of our altar cloths, everything. Um, and there's no, I don't know of any other liturgical tradition that uses galloon quite the way we do, and also like as much as we do. Um, because like this probably looks like, oh wow, she's got this huge spool of galloon. This is like nothing. Like we'll go through this in a few hours in the workshop, um, depending on what we're selling. We can go through this in, in okay, maybe a few hours. Six, seven, eight hours, we can go through this entire spool of galloon. So galloons, um, but it's very distinctive. And you can do a lot with galloon. You can change the whole feel of a set of essence by changing the style of galloon or the width or the color or whatever. So galloon's a really fun part. And I'll be doing another video on the um, artistry of vestments. And I'll talk a lot more about galloon and how to make proper galloon choices. Okay, now we've got that done. Now, we're gonna turn, I'm gonna turn off my machine. Oh, you'll notice too that I have gold thread in the upper because gold thread matches the galloon and it's kind of invisible. And then I have burgundy thread in the bottom because my lining is gonna be burgundy. So I'm gonna bring this now over to the ironing board and now I'm just gonna press my miters. Now remember a minute ago I said, you don't need to worry about those miters because what we're gonna do here is we're gonna fuss with them here. So what I'm doing here, and don't worry, you're gonna to get to see me do this several times, is I'm pushing that little bit out to where it 
becomes a 90 degree angle or as close as possible. You know, it's it's okay if it's an eighth of an inch over right there. It's okay. Nobody's, people are not going to be sitting there with a magnifying glass over your icon cover. So now over here, I'm making a false smiter because this is where I started and stopped. And here I'm basically trimming the glue. Okay. Now I'm going to take the underside and fold that under a little bit less than the top one, just so that it doesn't peek out there and get in my way. And I'm going to press that. Then I'm going to take and fold the top one. And I'm going to have the top one be just maybe a sixteenth of an inch beyond over the other one. Okay. Then now I've got this like, so I've got it like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one and I'm going to fold it like that. But here's something I want to show you. I'm going to press it, but I'm going to show you a little trick. I do not make, my trick is that I'm going to find a needle to show you this. I'm going to show you. I do not make my miters 100% perfectly um, 90 degree. I always leave about an eighth of an inch right up in here because that way you don't ever get a little bit of the glue tucking out, coming out from under the back side. That's just kind of a little trick. Okay, now the other thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to iron this thing all over again. You're like, wow, it's a lot of ironing. You have no idea how much ironing goes into vestments. It's so much ironing because we have to set this balloon. And I want to make sure that there's no pleats again. I want to make sure that, like, you know, if I had ironed this originally and it was still pretty warm and I had it folded up in my lap, it could be, it could get wrinkly. So I don't want that to happen. This is also removing out those ease pleats. Oh, I almost forgot the cross. We got to set the cross on. Um, it's, it's basically feathering out those ease pleats too. And then I'm going to iron up here and you're going to notice, oh, and then when I get down here, I'm doing my last two miters. I'm just going to pop those babies in place. You just have to kind of like tuck them in, get them to a nice look. There we go. Okay. But you'll notice that like, even though I took all those ease pleats all the way along here, you don't see it. They're, you, they're, it looks totally straight and clean. All those ease pleats just totally went away. They're just steamed out in the process because the glue is actually pretty flexible. Okay. The other thing you're going to notice too, you'll notice my upper bank, you'll notice right here I have a pin. That's to show me where to sew my cross. So the next thing I'm going to do is sew my cross. That's the next thing. So now we're back to the machine. It's a lot of back and forth sewing vestments. It's like you're up, you're down, you're up there anymore, you're down. Now, for that, we're going to use one of these machine applique crosses. Now, we have to be kind of careful with these because there's so many beads and sequins. And I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, the first thing, too, is that these guys have a little steam, or not steam. They used to be steam adhesive. Now, they're actually, like, adhesive. They're like stickers. Now, please, 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 you would never, ever want to put one of these on and just stick it in place. I've seen that done. It's very unprofessional. You have to sew them down because the adhesive will not stay for, like, years and years and years. So we take that off. Now, you do have to be a little careful, too. I, I kind of personally have a love-hate relationship with these. I kind of preferred the old crosses where we didn't have to stick them down. And, in fact, if you want them less sticky, you can kind of do this with your hands and kind of just remove that first little bit of sticky if you find it too sticky. But I have to say, I actually kind of preferred the old ones where we had to position them because these can sometimes be a little tricky to get them positioned correctly. Okay, so I'm going to get this in here and get this positioned and set it down really carefully. So, you know, I feel like I felt like I was off there a little bit. There we go. Okay, great. Now I'm going to get that first part done. Now here, I'm going to make sure that I'm really even. Okay, there we go. Okay. And like, I want to make sure that like the foot across here, like is, is, you know, lined up with the brocade and everything. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Once they're in place, they're awesome. But getting them in place, not so awesome. Okay. Now what we're going to do on here is we're going to put our machine stitch length down quite a bit. You're going to go down to like one, and it depends on your machine. On my machine, it's about one and a half to one and, I think here I can actually go to one and three quarters. Now I'm going to go one and a half, feel safer. And we are going to actually stitch in kind of in what's called the steek or around this metallic area. We're going to stitch in here, but to have maneuverability, we need to have that stitch length be really tight. Now, just like I made the balloon look easy, I'll make this look easy and this is tough. So I would say that of the whole process, getting the cross on is one of the most challenging things for an amateur seamstress. But again, just stick with it. You'll get it. Um, if you want to, like the other thing you can do is you can order some little crosses and practice first. Um, practicing before you get onto this big a piece of fabric is an awesome idea. So now I'm just gonna start at the bottom. 
Now, here at the bottom, when it's a straight line, I can totally just sew and, you know, just go right at it. But once I get up into this area, I am pretty much sewing this literally almost by hand with my flywheel. You can see that I'm using my flywheel and I'm being very careful to keep this kind of folded up here. This is a little easier to do on a industrial machine because I have a larger hoop. At a home machine, just wrap your fabric up even tighter so you can get in there, okay? But on, on this one, it's just, I just, so that's another way I just want to point out that I make it look a little easier. Partly that has to do with my machine makes it easier. I also have a flat tabletop, which makes it easier. Okay, so now I'm just going in and I'm stitching that cross. And we're going to be here for a little bit while I do this. So, okay. Now the cross is another area where you can just really make your icon stand cover just look amazing. Um, a number of years ago, I switched to using these footed crosses because of that. I just love the way they look. Oh, now here, be very careful. The little beads on here, like they just want to break. Oh my word, they just want to break all the time. There went one. You're going to lose some of them, and it's okay. Like I actually think they kind of use too many beads on these things to begin with. I think they're kind of problematic. So sometimes if I break one or two beads, I'm like, you know what, it's okay. No one's going to really notice if you're missing one little teeny tiny gold bead on top of a gold thread. So, so you're just going to, I will say, you're probably going to break some of those beads. Don't really sweat it too much. You can get some crosses that do not have any beads on them. I just can't get any um, footed crosses that don't have the, all the little beads and sequins sewn into them. Okay, now the other thing too here, be very careful that you're not accidentally catching this up under it because wow, if you ever do that and sew it at 1.5 stitches, yes, you'll be frustrated because then you have to unpick all those little, little, little tiny stitches. Okay, so now we're just going to keep going here. If I knew how to actually pause the video on my camera and like pick up the video, I would totally like pause and do one of those really professional videos where like they come back and like, meanwhile, you know, here's a, you know, on the cooking videos when it's like a perfectly diced bowl of onions when they say you need two cups of onions, you know, it would be like that. But you know what? I haven't figured out how to do that yet on my phone um, because videography just does not really, it's not my thing. I mean, I'm happy that we're able to start doing videos now to help teach some of these skills. But, needless to say, I'm a far better uh, seamstress than I am a video person. So, we all have our gifts. Okay. Okay. Oh, now one thing, we can talk about some other things while I'm doing this, like, very painstaking sewing of the cross. Um, and that's like, okay, care. Let's talk about care. The biggest thing that damages liturgical brocades is either human perspiration or dirt. Now, liturgical cloths, icon stand covers, altar cloths, they're not really getting touched or handled a lot, so their biggest enemy is dirt. So, how do you deal, deal with that? Well, what I would recommend is that when you're like a totally amazing pair of seamstress and you just made like six sets of gorgeous icon stand covers for your church, and some of them are being used in one season and some aren't, I would recommend that they're hung up either on a hanger in a closet that they are not stored in plastic. Never, never, never store your liturgical goods in plastic. Don't keep them in plastic from the dry cleaners. Don't store them in plastic totes. Nothing like that, okay? Because plastic off gases and it can discolor fabric and actually break it down over time. So you don't want it, you don't want to store your fabrics in any sort of plastic of any kind. Neither do you want to store them in anything like a hope chest or a cedar closet because wood actually off gases acetic acid and that's also damaging to fabric. So you're like, what's a girl to do? Okay, well here's what I like to do. I think one of the best ways you can store, one of the best inexpensive easy fixes for this is the next time you're at Goodwill or even just want to clean out your own linen cupboard, get a bunch of in ex, you know, just old cotton pillowcases. And for icon covers, what you would do is you would hang the icon cover over a hanger, and then you're gonna cut a hole in the top of that pillowcase, and you're gonna hang that pillowcase over the hanger. And there you go, it's like a perfect dust cover for icon stand covers. So like, especially like say you've got a set of blue icon stand covers that you made, and you're like, well, the gold ones are on right now, and we're not gonna put the blue, you know, it's like June, and you're like, okay, we're not gonna put the blue ones out till August, Put them in some sort of dust cover. Um, 
If you don't have st hanging storage space, which I know a lot of churches have trouble with that, then you can put them like in a dresser or something like that, but I would still wrap them in cotton first, just to kind of give a little extra edge of protection. The other thing is that occasionally they will need to be dry cleaned. Now, not very often. I, um, altar cloths need to be dry cleaned like maybe every like five or six years. Not very often at all. And you want to make sure you choose a dry cleaner who is familiar with working with these kind of materials. So my general rule of thumb is I tell people to call the fanciest bridal shop you have in your town and ask them who they recommend as a dry cleaner. You preferably want a dry cleaner who does in-house cleaning, who doesn't send it all out preferably family owned if you can find one. And you absolutely want to tell them to not in, like use all the new environmental dry cleaning. You need to be really careful about that because a lot of dry cleaners will say that it's environmentally dry cleaning, but it's actually water immersion. It means they're taking your thing and you're, they're putting it in water. And that will damage the galoon and the fringe and the cross. Surprisingly, the brocade can actually go in water, but um, it's not good for it. What you actually need is old school, perk dry cleaning, that's what they used to call it, and you need it to actually be non-water immersed, and you need to make very certain that your dry cleaner understands that. In the last five years, I've had a lot of clients, a lot of my um, clients who are priests, who have very beautiful, expensive sets of vestments, have sustained some damage because their dry cleaner thought they could stick stuff in water that should never go in water. So be careful of that. Um, now the little linen lefkia, I guess I'm going to make a little, a little exception to that rule. The little linen lefkia, I probably would on those recommend if you're going to make those, wash, pre-wash your linen first and your little bit of maybe your trim so that those could be washed because those are going to pick up some soot and some candle wax and things like that. And they'll, they'll get stained by maybe flowers being put on them and things like that. Those can be really nice to actually be washed. And when we make kind of a larger version of those called an elaton for an altar cloth, it's essentially a white linen dust cloth for an altar cloth. Um, and those have to be washed because they get messy. They're actually taking the, you'd rather have that little linen piece take the kind of the brunt of the wear and tear than you do the actual expensive altar cloth with all the galoon and crosses and all that good stuff. Okay, we are finally done with the cross. Yay! Okay, and at the end, you'll notice that I am not... I am not back tacking, I'm blending. Okay, and that is going to be the end of part one, and we will come back with part two in, a, in the second video. Thank you.